this was it. This was the moment I'd been waiting for for, for weeks, I mean, really for months, and it was all coming down to this, the very last shot of the episode. Pouring down the hills came the Urgasso Marauders atop their Megaloceros mounts, catching the menagerie unawares on their march to Throca's Cradle. The commander's tent rushed into the fray, attempting to blunt the thunderous cavalry before it could crash into their unsuspecting troops. Umber threw his enchanted spear, unhorsing raider after raider with each throw. Both Griffin and Remoraz received the worst of the charge, battered within an inch of their life by spear, antler, and hooves. Remoraz cast a hypnotic pattern, drifting magical leaves that ensnared the attention of three of the charges, and of Unicorn. When the battle was won, Umber had claimed one of the Megaloceros for himself, while the rest galloped away before Griffin could tame one of his own. In the broader battle, the army achieved a similar triumph. Taking a gamble, they sent their infantry forward in a wedge, where they endured attacks from marauders on both sides, supported by orcish bone shapers in the hills. Despite heavy resistance, the infantry held the center, and bolstered by suppressing fire from the artillery and healing magic from the clergy, refused to fold. Only the siege engineers proved unsuccessful, disarray among their ranks fumbling shot after shot. In the end, unexpected reinforcements, a warg pack called the Baugri, crashed into the Urgasho lines from the rear and finally routed them. After the battle, they met Geish, a representative of the Baugri warg pack and an ally of Throkakorv, who agreed to escort them south to the cradle. The primary entrance to the cradle was through the Jaws, a pair of enormous bone gates that guards the passage between the Tusk, two of the cradle's five encircling mountains. Here, they met Throka Steel Sword, the Corv's military commander and an old rival of Umber's. While on orders to allow the menagerie inside, he refused to let the bulk of their army pass the Jaws and instead forced the commander's tent to march across the cradle and get permission from Throka Throck himself. Before departing the rest of the company, Umber and Dunya Dragonbane got into yet another argument, Umber chastising the former queen for her holier-than-thou attitude. Climbing the North Tusk to the orcish burg of Ashnar, the commander's tent gazed there first upon the cradle, a pristine wilderness, tropical in the midst of winter, and untouched by any trace of civilization. On their walk to Hythroka, Unicorn attempted to pick some fruit for their kombucha, but was rebuked by their orcish escort. It was strictly against the ancient traditions of the orcs to disturb the earth of the cradle, whether by agriculture, mining, or even foraging. Midway on their march to the Throck, they stopped over in the burg of Kostrock, constructed on the cliffs of a broad plateau. There, they met the heavily pregnant Throka Many Mother, Throka Throck's current wife. In a speech to Kostrak's assembled populace, she advocated for trusting the menagerie, despite their obvious status as foreigners. While Chimera was surprisingly flustered to meet her, Many Mother was nonetheless very pleased to meet these famous mercenaries, and informed them that the pastures above Kostrak would be prepared for their eventual camping ground once the bulk of the army was permitted inside. As they climbed the Horn, the cradle's tallest mountain and the seat of Throka's power, Remoraz made an awkward attempt to reach out to Unicorn to thank him for the healing that he received during their battle against the Urgasso. Umber, meanwhile, commiserated with Chimera about his falling out with Dunya, and expressed for the first time an interest in remaining here in the cradle after the contract expired. Atop the horn, the characters reached High Throka and met Throka Finefeather, an ancient orc druid and spiritual advisor to the Throck. At her behest, they placed all their metal objects, weapons, armor, belt buckles, outside his yurt to avoid aggravating his condition. After much ado, the commander's tent stepped beneath the eaves of his snow-white yurt, and there met his potency, the crown immovable, son of earth, father of orcs, throck of throcks, lord of beast and blood and bone. Throka throck. And that's where we ended the session. How did it go? Um, it was interesting. It was sort of half of a good session, and I think kind of half of a bad session. I think people had fun in the first half of the combat, but the second one got to be a little bit um, talky on my part. But we'll cover that in a little bit. How does mass combat work? So the way I run my mass combat is inspired very much by Matt Colville's Strongholds and Followers style of mass combat, but it's a little bit simplified for the needs of my players. So each army has a certain number of units. These units can be small, medium, or large. They can be infantry, cavalry, artillery, clergy, any number of other things. They can be you know, light, standard, heavy, all different kinds of qualifications. Each army kind of arrays their units however they would like, and then the party, 
um, gets to decide which one of the enemy units they as a party want to target. And then we kind of like zoom into a more traditional Dungeons and Dragons style combat where they fight kind of a representational number of enemies. At the end of each round, though, we cut out from the small battle into a larger battle, and we have the units engage in kind of like a, a very simplistic form of sort of war gaming, where they fight, and they roll morale, and they take over other units, and each unit has special abilities, that kind of thing. In this case, the party targeted the Megaloceros right away, which kind of makes sense. It was the biggest, scariest-looking unit. Um, during the fight themselves, they really took a beating from that initial charge. It's a really nasty kind of stack-up of attacks. It's like a spear attack, and then an antler attack, and then a hoof attack. So it was like 30-40 damage in one long go. But after that point, thanks to Remoraz dropping a hypnotic pattern and catching three of the four uh, riders, they weren't as effective. But I think that initial shock of getting hit for so much damage sort of did all the legwork I needed the encounter to do. These guys are serious and not to be trifled with. I probably should have expected that somebody would try to tame one of these elks. Uh, Umber is trained in animal handling and it's never come up before, so it was kind of a cool thing to see him start to interact with this animal. How much it's going to affect the combats going forward, I'm not sure. Um, he's not really specialized to ride on this thing's back, but I also didn't want to take it away from him. So he currently has it and he's like mulling over a name, which I'm equal parts excited and anxious to hear what he picks. The second half, though, I feel like was a lot of talking. At this point, the menagerie is stepping into the cradle. This is going to be a location they spend a lot of time in over the next arc, which could be months. And so I really wanted to make sure it felt like a vibrant, interesting place with a lot of different characters. And the politics not only felt unique and orcish, but also understandable. But it just it kind of ended up being this sort of tour of this new location and me describing things and describing things and describing things and meeting characters and having them talk and then meet other characters and they talk and those characters talk to each other and just kind of a lot of talking for me. Um, it's something that I'm constantly struggling against. How do I paint this interesting world without just blathering on the whole time with all of these ideas that I had? I first of all tried to space out the different NPCs that they met. So like kind of, you meet one and then you travel a little bit, you meet another, you travel a little bit, you meet another. And then while traveling, I tried to give them opportunities to sort of to play out a couple of different scenes. So let's talk about that world building just a little bit. I did spend a lot of time on it and I'm a little self-conscious that I spent maybe too much time I want to go through some of these characters because they're going to be relevant in upcoming recaps. So right when the party crossed the threshold and entered the cradle, the first character they met was Throka Steel Sword. The idea with this character is that he is the Kofer, so he's the commander, the military leader of the, of the cradle, and he is sort of an old rival of Umber's. There's some discussion about Umber's real name, Throka Sellsword, and some story about how when he was a kid, he sold this precious item, this metal sword made of, you know, star iron or whatever it's called. I haven't come up with a name for it yet, but this sort of meteor metal sword, um, which is something very rare and precious in Orcish culture, to this other son of the Throck, uh, Throka, who then became known as Throka Steel Sword. And so they have kind of an immediate rivalry. They're sort of butting heads. They didn't get along as kids. Now they're not going to get along here as adults. So obviously this guy is the butt head. This is the, the, the primary kind of antagonist, the one who's going to stand in their way. And of course he's in charge of the Cradle's military, which means they're going to constantly be butting heads with him as they're trying to command the Throck's troops in battle. After the characters traveled for a little bit to the small burg of Kostrok, they met the next important member of the, uh, the court, and that is Throka Many Mother. She is a Grazia, so basically the spouse of a Throck. The weird thing about most orcs is that their lifespans are extremely short. They only live to be about 15 years, kind of in contrast to how long elves and dwarves can live. There's a whole That's a whole thing we can get into later, but for the purposes of this session, the idea is that whenever Throka Throck remarries, the Korv, the people, elect a spouse for him to marry. So it's political, yes, but it isn't a matter of like making alliances. It's almost like an alliance between the Throck and their people to ensure that you know, they rule harmoniously. It then becomes the Grazia's job, or the chosen mate, to ensure that the Throck's policies you know, are in accordance with the people's wishes, right? And to kind of communicate as a go-between. So there's very political, they're almost kind of like a senator or something like that. And that's how they meet Many Mother. Uh, she's young, she's passionate, and there's some drama that we haven't kind of unearthed with her yet. But the main drama that you see is that clearly Chimera was not really expecting the Throck to have remarried, and she's got some feelings about this. But that's Throck a many mother, this kind of canny, political, populist figure amongst the Corv. Next, right on the doorstep of meeting the Throck himself, they met his spiritual advisor, Throck a Finefeather. Now, Throck a Finefeather is a druid. She's a Dars Drohed, which means she's the first druid of the Corv. And that means that her lifespan is also extended unnaturally, kind of like uh, the, the timeless body feature that high-level druids have. 
Uh, so she knew Umber when he was a kid and has this very grandmotherly figure. I described her as being dressed in this raiment of all these different feathers, but being stooped and hunched, almost the size of like a dwarf or a gnome. That's kind of old and withered she is. And she's this crafty sort of uh, smirking grandmother figure that we're going to learn a lot more about. And the last image of the entire episode was, of course, Throka Throck. Um, I wanted to show them this art that I had commissioned. I want to give a quick shout out to Neve McMaster, who is our sort of portrait artist. They have very graciously let me use their art uh, both for the campaign and here on the show. Uh, and just take a look at this incredible portrait. There's so much detail to absorb here. If you want to see a higher res version of this, check out the uh, description below. I really wanted to design a cultural costume for Throkathrock that wasn't drawing on too many influences from other cultures that wouldn't seem appropriative. And so Nia did a lot of work in the character concepting phase to help design this outfit. We'll talk a lot more about Throkathrock as a character next time, but I could not wait to show you this art. We had a couple of really nice character moments in the episode too I want to touch on. The big one, of course, is still Umber and Dunya. And it was the first time we'd heard from Dunya in a couple of sessions. It was really nice to touch back to that. And I think this might be the beginning of the end for them. This was a pretty adversarial confrontation. She had expressed some frustration that she wasn't being brought along to meet Throkathrock, and they kind of got into it, and she had kind of offhandedly slighted one of the other members of the company, kind of describing the rest of them as idiots. And Umber took umbrage with this, of course, and kind of gave her an ultimatum. Like, you have to lose this holier-than-thou attitude. Uh, he tried to assert that they're all equal in the company. And while he made some good points about Dunya's attitude, I don't think he's really considered how much he personally benefits from being the child of the commander. So the next time the two of them interact, we're probably going to see those sparks fly again. That may be the end of their relationship, especially considering the signals that Umber's been putting out. I want to give a shout out quick to Remoraz and Unicorn. Uh, the, with Willow kind of hanging between them, this was Hallie's attempt to kind of reach out to Unicorn as a character and try to establish a more friendly relationship. I don't think that Unicorn has any hangups about Remoraz. I think they're all kind of in Remoraz's head, but it was kind of cool to see Unicorn and just sort of blithely be like, yeah, man, it's cool, whatever. I don't understand what this is about, right? And then lastly, I wanted to touch on Chimera and Throkathrock really quickly. There's this unspoken something that happened between Chimera, Yorgos, and Throkathrock way, way back in their past. Obviously, Chimera has had, you know, relations and born children on both of them. Um, but the last time she met Yorgos, they were very antagonistic. Clearly, there was some bad blood there. I kind of wanted to do the opposite with Rokathrock and say that she still has a lot of kind of fond feelings for him. And that coming back here is sort of weird and awkward for her. So especially when she sees Many Mother, the Throck's new wife, she doesn't quite know how to feel about it, right? I liked the idea of this, like, this super jaded, scarred, cynical character getting a little nervous and fluttery around someone that she has this crush on, right? But I want to know, who do you think is right? Do you think that Umber is being too harsh to Dunya, not taking the fact that she's newly disabled and, and a former queen and kind of being sidelined by the company? Or do you think that Dunya's expectations are unrealistic, that she's acting holier than now and that she's above all of this petty mercenary stuff, that she's kind of getting what she signed up for? Post your comments below. I'm curious to see which side you're on, Team Umber or Team Dunya. Behold, the button smashable, father of subscriptions, lord of clicks and content. Also, you know, the bell helps too. As always, this show and everything I do is brought to you by my Patreon. If you like this show and want to see more episodes, please consider joining. You can find the links to it and all my other social media down below. But until next time, thank you so much for watching, and as always, happy adventuring.